From Tallahassee, Florida's capital city, North Florida Baptist Church presents the Family Bible Hour. Stay tuned for 60 minutes of beautiful hymns, musical groups, and solos with a special presentation from the North Florida Choir and Orchestra. Hear our pastor, Dr. Randy Ray, as he shares a powerful message from God's Word aimed at encouraging your life. Experience firsthand this time of worship and praise and be challenged by the preaching of God's Word. This is the Family Bible Hour. I'm glad you're here today. Take your Bibles, turn to John chapter 4. In just a minute, I'm going to have us stand and we're going to read some verses together. All right, John chapter 4. Um, we've been here five weeks, my wife and I are blessed of God to be here, and uh, Tallahassee is kind of an easy place to learn. Uh, it's not that hard to get around. I feel like I can get anywhere in 10 or 15 minutes. I said, this is pretty cool. Well, my, my parents were asking me what it was like, and I said, well, it's, I thought it would be flat and sandy like most of Florida. I said, but it's not. And I said, it's, I was told it was the city on seven hills. And I said, it's really up and down. I said, it's kind of like Middle Tennessee with palm trees. You can't get much better than that, all right? So I can be the ocean in an hour or so, so we can't beat that, all right? But uh, anyway, uh, most of our ministry has been working with uh, young people and children. And uh, uh, I, I, I still love being around teenagers, still love being around the children. And, and the Lord's led us here to start a college-age class, college student class. And so we've uh, had our third Sunday, Sunday school class this morning, so we're excited about that. Uh, thinking of the children, I was, uh, you know, the kids, when you're in children's church, if you ask a question, the, the number one answer, do you know what it is? It's Jesus, all right? If the kid doesn't know the answer, he raises his hand, what? Jesus. Now, that's a good guess, but that wasn't, but uh, that's usually what it is. But one day I was, I was teaching the kids, and uh, I was reviewing the lesson, and I got down to the end, and I said, now, if a person has trusted Jesus Christ, their Savior, he's asked them into their heart, Jesus has forgiven their sin. Where are they going to go when they die? And man, all these kids will raise their hands. And I picked this one little girl and she said, heaven. I said, that's right. I said, now, if a person has never accepted Jesus as their Savior, their sins have not been forgiven, they're going to have to pay for their own sin. Where does the Bible say that person's going to have to go? And all these kids are raising their hands. And I picked this one little kid and he said, Mexico. <laughs> and... Uh, it struck me so funny, I almost couldn't keep going with the lesson. I'm thinking, I said, it's hot in Mexico, but it's not quite that, you know. But So when you're in the children's church, you never know what kind of an answer you're going to get. But let's look at John chapter 4. If you'll stand with me, I want us to read these verses. I'm going to read them out loud. John chapter 4, we're going to start in verse 1. All right, John chapter 4, verse 1. And uh, I normally don't read this many verses. I have been known to read a whole chapter, but this time we're going to read 15 verses because it kind of does the setting of what we're talking about this morning. John chapter 4 and verse 1. When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee, and he must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now jo Jacob's well was there. Jesus therefore being wearied with his journey, set thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink, for his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, Thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us, this, which gave us the well and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be up uh, in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. This morning I want to talk to you about this topic, a divine appointment. A divine appointment. Let's pray. 
Lord, thank you for being so gracious to you, Lord. It was wonderful singing about your grace is enough. And Lord, you truly are a gracious God. And Lord, as we look in your word this morning, I pray that the Holy Spirit will guide my thoughts. Lord, I pray I wouldn't say anything that wouldn't be pleasing to you. And I pray you'd guide my thoughts. And Lord, for those of us that know you as our Savior already, I pray you'd speak to our heart about divine appointments in our life. And then, Lord, for those who might be here this morning and they've never trusted you as their Savior, I pray that today would be the day of their divine appointment, that today would be the day they trust you as their Savior for the forgiveness of their sin, that you might have this eternal life, this living water that we're going to talk about this morning. So, Lord, meet with us right now. Thank you for loving us so much. And we pray your will be done in this service and in the invitation to follow. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. The definition of a divine appointment is this, a meeting which is inspired and God-led. Right here in this passage that we just read was definitely a divine appointment. Some other examples would be, if you remember when Esther was going before the king to try to save the Jews, and uh, she overthrew wicked Haman. Probably another really good one that we can remember is when Philip is in Jerusalem and God calls him out into the desert and he goes and he meets the Ethiopian eunuch who was out there reading the book of Isaiah and did not understand what he was reading and God it says the spirit called Philip out there and Philip goes and gets up in the chariot with him and leads him to Christ that would be an example of a divine appointment several years ago we were having a revival at our church and uh, an evangelist named Pete Rice and the Lord really really did an awesome uh, a thing in the lives of our people. We saw many people saved. It went from Sunday through Wednesday, and it was a great revival. And I remember one night when we got to the invitation, um, I would come forward to kind of stand over to the side, and, and the evangelist was giving the invitation, and people were coming to the altar. And he, and he looked over at me, and he pointed, he told me to come to him. So I walked over there, and he covered his lapel mic up, and he said, I really feel like God is telling me that I need to tell you that you need to just walk down the middle aisle and see if there's anybody that needs to talk to you. Well, I'd never done anything like that in my life during an invitation. And I said, okay, okay. And heads were bowed and eyes were closed. People were standing up. So I walked over to the middle aisle and I started walking down the middle aisle and I, I was walking and I'm, I'm praying. I'm saying, Lord, show me who I'm supposed to talk to. And I, I'm looking and, and I'm, I'm thinking, okay, I guess I'm going to catch eyes with somebody and they're going to nod at me that they want to talk to me. So I started and, I, and I'm looking left and I'm looking right. And I get about halfway back, nothing's happened. So I start slowing down, and I'm, I'm saying, Lord, don't, don't let me miss the person. And, and I keep walking, and I keep walking. Finally, I'm almost to the back door, and I'm thinking, Lord, I, who, who is it? Who is it? And, I'm, and I get to the back doors. It was just like this. I get to the back doors. Nobody, nobody looked at me. I didn't, look at, I didn't see anybody eye contact. And I'm thinking, I, I missed it. I, I was supposed to talk to somebody. And so I open the doors, and when I open the doors, I walk down into the foyer. When I walked into the foyer, about five seconds later, that left door into the foyer opens up and a teenager that had been visiting comes walking out there and he comes running over to me. And this is what he said. He said, Brother Tommy, I'm so glad you came to the back. I need to get saved, but I was scared to death to go down to the front. Now, it put chills on my arm. I mean, it makes me emotional even today because I didn't know what was going on, but God did. And that was a divine appointment. And the, and the God led that evangelist to tell someone, walk down that middle aisle. He didn't know why either. But that young man was over here on this side and was afraid to come forward. But when he saw somebody go to the back, he said, I can go to the back. And he went to the back. You see, the possibility of divine appointments in our life are just endless. It's just endless. And the key is this, walking in the Spirit of God. That's why the, the Bible says to walk in the Spirit of God, to be filled with the Spirit of God, so that when that divine appointment comes, I'm ready. I see it. I wonder how many times I've missed it because I was living in the flesh. I was living up for myself, and I just wasn't paying attention. And God put somebody right there in my face, and I just went right on my merry way and missed that opportunity to talk to somebody about the Lord. Today we're going to see a divine appointment at this woman that comes to a well in the life of Jesus Christ. In fact, if you read the life of Jesus Christ, you'll realize his entire life was a life of divine appointments. But Jesus, when he gets there in John chapter 4, and he starts talking to this woman of Samaria, he ends up breaking three Jewish customs. I'm going to mention them to you right now. We're going to talk about them in just a few moments. The first one was this. He spoke to a woman. 
She even said, why you being a Jew speaking to me as a woman? He spoke to a woman, him being a Jew, a Jewish man speaking to a woman. Next thing was this, she was a Samaritan and he was a Jew. The Jews had no dealings with the Samaritans. The third custom that he broke was this. He asked her for a drink of water, which would have made him ceremonial unclean if he used her cup or her jar to drink out of. Now, most of you probably know that the Jews and the Samaritans did not get along. The, the, the Jews did not get along with the Samaritans because the Samaritans were mainly half Jewish. So they looked at them and said, because you're not full-blooded Jewish, you're not near as good as I am. And they looked down upon them. It was a racial problem that they had. And the Jews were dead wrong in that. But they looked down and they even got to the point where they wouldn't even go through Samaria because they hated the Samaritans so much. Now, there was three routes to Jerusalem that Jesus could have taken. One route went along the Jordan River. It's, it's still even there today. The most direct route went through Samaria, but most of the Jews would not take that route. They would go out of their way just so they didn't have to go through Samaria. But if you look in verse 4, it says this, and he or Jesus must needs go through Samaria. There was a need, there was a reason why Jesus had to go through Samaria. And you know what it was? It was a woman who was going to meet him at a well. It was the need of the Samaritan woman. Now, it says that he cometh to the city in verse 5, which is called Sychar. Now, Sychar is where he ends up meeting this woman at the well, and it was by Jacob's well, and it's located by a mountain called Gerizim, and it's also the site of the Samaritan temple. Now, it would be like Samaria's holy place. So when Jesus goes to Samaria, and he goes up to this well, he's actually going right in to my, what they would call their holy place, a religious place. Now, the first thing I want us to notice this morning is this. Number one, Jesus was not controlled by the physical. He was not controlled by the physical. Let's look at verse 5 and 6 again. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. Being wearied. If you just read that, you think, well, Jesus must have been a little bit tired. But Jesus had walked over 30 miles before he got there. 30 miles. That's a long walk. That was an all-day walk. He had walked 30 miles to get there. And then when it says the sixth hour, it was at noon. It was in the very heat of the day. But you know what? Jesus never got too tired for other people. He never got too tired for other people. I remember years ago, one of my pastor friends told me the story, and he said one night, in the middle of the night, he got a phone call. And it was a family calling out saying that their relative had been in an accident. They didn't think he was going to live. They didn't think he was a believer. Would you please come to the hospital? It was in the middle of the night. He said, I woke up, and he said, I'm trying to think through it. Okay, which hospital? He said, man, I was so tired. And he said, I, I hung up, and he said, I thought, i got to just get woke up. He said, I laid back down thinking, okay, i just got to get myself awake. And he said, the next thing I knew, I woke up, and it was like two hours later. He said, I literally leaped out of the bed with fear. And he said, I got my clothes on, I ran, I got in the car. He said, I got to the hospital. And when he said, I got to the hospital and I went run into the room, he said, they were all out in the hallway and they were crying. The relative had died. He said, it has haunted him to this day that he missed that opportunity because he laid back down. He was tired and rightly so, I understand that. But he said, it haunted him. Day, and he told me this one time, he said, I've actually had dreams. He said, I never saw the man. But he said, I've actually had dreams where I would wake up in a sweat at night because that, it felt like that man was crying out to me and he said, I would relive it again. And he said, God used it in my life to make sure I never missed an appointment like that again. You see, God puts those divine appointments. Now Jesus goes to Samaria and there's only one reason he's going and it's a lady that's going to meet him at a well. It's not always easy to serve the Lord. Sacrifices have to be made. If you live the Christian life, you're going to make sacrifices in your life. You're going to live your life for others and not yourselves. There's times when you might say, man, I'm just too tired to go to church this morning. Florida State played last night. All right. There might be times when you say, you know what? I am tired. I got off of work and whew, I just don't feel like going to church on Wednesday. I am worn out. I've had those feelings too. 
But you know what? There's times when you say, I just don't know if I want to do this or do that because we get tired. But you know what? Jesus never let the physical stop him. Christians are used to spread the gospel around the world. How can we be too tired? The world is run by tired people. So we as Christians pray for strength that God can use us. You remember when Jesus takes the disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane right before he's going to be crucified? And he tells them, can you wait right here for an hour? And he goes and prays, and he comes back, and what are they doing? They're sleeping. And he says, could you not wait just an hour? Could you not wait just an hour? So Jesus gets to this well in Samaria, and he's not too tired. He's not too tired to have an important conversation with a woman. Secondly, I want you to notice this. Jesus breaks all barriers. Verse 7, 8, and 9. Verse 7, Then come, there come a woman, a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou being a Jew askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? And the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. You know what? Nationalities mean nothing to God. Nationalities mean nothing to Jesus. Jesus doesn't care where you're born, where you live, what you look like, what color you are. None of that matters to God. The Bible says, for God so loved the what? The world. And sometimes we tend to look at it the wrong way, but God loves you just as much as he loves me, and he loves me just as much as he loves you. And when Jesus comes to this Samaritan woman, he doesn't even look at her as a Samaritan woman. He looks at her as a soul. He looks at her as a person that needs God, that needs God. You see, the Samaritan woman is saying, why are you even talking to me? Now, something about Jesus let her know that he was a Jew. Maybe it was the way he spoke. Maybe it was his, uh, the way he spoke the language. Maybe it was the way he was dressed. But somehow when she looked at Jesus, she said, that's a Jewish man. But you know what? Jesus looked at her and he could have said the way she's dressed, the way she talks, her actions, whatever about her, she's a Samaritan, but Jesus saw past all of that. Because God goes to the heart. God goes to the place that matters the most. He goes to the heart of the person. So when he says, give me to drink, and she says, why are you asking me that? Jesus has a purpose, and the purpose is to reach her. Now, first of all, we said this, she's a woman. The three customs, she's a woman. The, the, the disciples, when the disciples returned in this story later on, they themselves looked at Jesus and said, why are you talking to her? The disciples even said that. Why are you talking to her, Jesus? She's a Samaritan. She's a Samaritan. You see, back then the custom was not to talk to a woman. Listen to this. I did not know this. For a Jewish man to speak to a woman in public was a definite breach of social custom. Listen to this. Many Jewish men would not even speak to their wives in public. Pretty sad. But that was a Jewish custom. Second of all, she was a Samaritan. In Jesus' day, there was bitter hostility between Jews and Samaritans. So when this woman says, you're a Samaritan, I'm a Samaritan, you're a Jew, why are you speaking to me? There was a reason she had behind that. Now, let me read this to you to give you a little bit of background between Jews and Samaritans. The reason for the hostility of the Jews to the Samaritan went back a long way. When the Assyrians, remember I told you Samaritans are half Assyrians, when the Assyrians took Samaria captive, they took out large numbers of the people that lived there, and they replaced them by their people from all over the empire. So what happened was this. They take some of the Samaritans out, they bring their people in, and then they also brought in their false religions. But here's what happened. So Samaritans had believed in the one true God, but when these false religions came in, they started blending their religion. That happens a lot. That's why God told the Jews many times, he said, when you go in and you take over this nation, you battle against them, and I give you victory, don't get into their false gods. Knock down those groves that they go and worship all these false gods. But many times the Jews would go in and they would say, out of curiosity, I wonder how they worship that, that God. I wondered how they did this. And they would start trying to blend their, their true religion with a false religion. So here, that's what happened to the Samaritans. They were trying to blend it in. Now, because of that, the Jews had no dealings with them. Now, listen to this. For a Jewish person to call someone a Samaritan was like a major, what we would call put down or cut down or slander. 
But you know what? In John chapter 8 and verse 48, you know what the Jews did when Jesus was getting ready to go to the cross? They said, aren't you a Samaritan? You know what they were saying to Jesus? We're putting you down. You're not God. You're nobody important. Aren't you a Samaritan? And they were putting him down to call someone a Samaritan. Now, here's the third thing. This woman was immoral. She was immoral. Now, I want you to look down at verse number 16. Jesus saith unto her, Go call thy husband and come hither. He tells her to go call her husband and then come back. He says, verse 17, The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and he, or the man you're living with now, is not your husband. He said, In that you said truly. He says, um, Go call your husband. She says, uh, I don't have a husband. He says, you're right. You've had five. You're living with another man right now. Now, when somebody tells you something like that, it would kind of blow your mind. If somebody walked up and started talking to me, and they're starting to tell me things, and I'm thinking, how do you know this? How do you, who told you that about me? How do you know that about me? Jesus was, in a way, saying, listen, I know everything about you. I know everything about you. I know everything about you. Now, Jesus here, number three, is this. Jesus turns the topic to spiritual. He turns the topic to spiritual. Now, when he says, when he says, go call your husband, and she says, I don't have a husband. He says, you're living with somebody. You've had five husbands. The person you're living with is not your husband. And he starts talking along that line. She says, wow. Okay, how does this guy know this? How does this man know this? So look in verse Verse 10, the woman, uh, Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou would have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Notice her response. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? You have no bucket. You have no pan. You have nothing on a rope to drop down into the well and pull it back up. So how are you going to give me this living water? Verse 12. Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave, gave us the well and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? And what she don't know is, yes, he's much greater than Jacob. He's much greater than Jacob. He created Jacob. You see? Verse 13. Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Now, here's the thing. Jesus takes the conversation and he turns it to spiritual, but she's still talking physical. He's talking about living water. She's just talking about water. She said, give me some water. Give me that water that I don't have to come back here tomorrow and get some more water. Give me that water. I can even give it to my animals and I don't have to water my camels anymore. Give me that water. Man, that would be awesome. You would save me a lot of work. She's still talking physical. But Jesus is talking spiritual. He says, you drink this water, you're going to be back tomorrow because you're going to thirst again. But if you drink the water that I give you, you will never thirst again. So he takes this topic and he turns it to spiritual. Now, the next point is this. He points to her sin. Now, he goes to the important part here. He's taking the conversation and he's taking it from a, a meeting and he's taking it all the way over to where he's bringing her to himself. He points to her sin. We read it where he says, you've got a husband, you've had five husbands, you're living with a guy. So he turns it. Now, when he says that, Let's go ahead and go to the next one. She points to her religion. Look in verse 19. The woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. She's thinking, how do you know these things? How would you know this about me unless you're a prophet? Verse 20. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in the, this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship ye know not what. 
We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews, but the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. She, he points to her sin, and she says, oh, you must be a religious man. You must be a prophet. And then she says this. We believe, as Samaritans, that we're supposed to worship up here on this mountain. But you Jews believe that you're supposed to worship down in Jerusalem. Remember I said that well was in their, their worship area, their, their place of, of where they would go to worship. So she says, we say you worship here, and you say you worship there. She's getting in a discussion and a debate with him. You see, he points out to his religion, but he's saying this. It's not where you worship, it's who you worship. It's not where you worship, but it's who you worship. You see, the next thing is this. She was looking for the Messiah. She was looking for the Messiah. She had no idea she was talking to him. Verse 25. The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. Now, that was a big statement. You're looking for the Messiah, and what you don't know is, I am the Messiah. You're talking to the Messiah. You're talking to the Messiah. You see, verse 27 And upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked to the woman, yet no man said, What seekest thou, or why talkest thou with her? You see, the disciples next questioned in their heart. They questioned in their heart. He tells this woman, you're talking to the Messiah. You know that when Messiah comes, he's going to tell you all things. You're talking to him. In other words, he's saying, salvation is of the Jews, but salvation has come to you as a Samaritan woman. I am he. The disciples come back and they say, Why are you talking to this lady? But you know what? No one dared ask Jesus that question. In verse 27, they're thinking in their heart, why are you talking with her? But they're not saying it. They're not saying it. They question in their heart. Number eight is this. The woman accepts the Lord and begins to tell others in her town. Look at verse 28. The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city And saith to the men, Come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Is not this the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came unto him. Now listen, she had come to the well to do one thing. What was that? To get water. But when Jesus says, I am the Messiah. You know what she did? She just forgot all about what she came there for. She drops the water pot. She runs back into the city and she says, Come see a man that knows everything about me. He knows everything about me. Is not this the Messiah? Is not this the Christ? Her whole outlook on life changed. All of a sudden, what was so important to her was not important at all. Her priorities totally changed because she met God. She met God. You see, the woman accepts the Lord and begins to tell others. She left her water pot. It kind of reminds me of Peter leaving fishing and Matthew leaving tax collecting. And I don't know where you were in your life when you found Jesus Christ, but I'm sure your priorities and your life changed also. And the things that you thought were so important weren't really important anymore because you met Jesus Christ. Let's look at verse 31 as we see the lesson to the disciples. In the meanwhile, the disciples prayed him saying, Master, eat. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that you know not of. Therefore saith the disciples one to another, Hath any man brought him aught to eat? Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Say not ye there yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, Lift up your eyes, look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is that saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. I sent you to reap that whereon you bestow no labor, other men labored, and ye are entered into the labors. The disciples come back, and you know what the important thing is to them? Master, eat some meat. Take care of your physical body. And Jesus says, I have spiritual things to do. 
I have the, my meat is to do the will of God the Father that sent me here. And he's telling his disciples, he's saying, look out on the field of people. Look at the harvest because it's already ready to be reaped. There's people out there. There's a Samaritan woman that you're asking me why I even talk to her because you don't see the harvest. You don't see the divine appointment. You don't see the right in front of you is somebody that needs God. You see the lesson to the disciples. The lesson to the disciples. Let me finish with this. The Samaritan woman has divine appointments all over town. Verse 39. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him. Why? Look at this. For the saying of the woman, which testified, he told me all that ever I did. So when the Samaritans were coming to him, they besought him that he would tarry with them, and he abode there two days. And many more believed because of his own word. And said unto the woman, Now we believe not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves, and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. When that verse says, and he must have needs to go through Samaria, it even got bigger than the woman. It even got more than just this one woman. Because Jesus saw a whole city that needed to be saved. You see, the Samaritan woman, she started bringing people to Christ instantly. She started bringing people over and over. About two weeks ago, when we, we, we've moved into an apartment, and I want to be honest with you, when we moved here, we wanted to rent a house, and we tried for three days to find a house to rent, and we couldn't find one. And every day I would get to the end of the day and Pastor Ray would call me and he'd say, did you find a house? And I'd say, oh, we didn't find one. And I would apologize to him and he'd say, well, that's okay, stay another night in the hotel. And after the, about three nights I'm thinking, he's going to think I just want to stay in the hotel. For, you know. And so uh, we're just running up a bill. you know. And, uh, but I kept saying, we, we just couldn't find a home. And finally on, after that third day, third day of couldn't find a home, we got back to the hotel and we were laying in bed that night and I told Don, I said, you know what? I think maybe God just wants us to rent an apartment. Maybe that's what we're supposed to do. So I got out of bed and I went and looked on the internet and I found some apartments and we started going around the next day and we found an apartment pretty quick and we got in there and you know what? I didn't, I didn't think I was going to live in an apartment. I thought I was going to live in a house. But you know what? Living in an apartment has been a blessing to us. A great blessing. You see, I had a plan. I wanted to live in a house. But God says, no, I'm going to put you in an apartment. And the reason is because there's people in that apartment that need Jesus. And it's been amazing how God's let us meet all these people that I tell you, I would have never met had I lived in a home. I would have never met them. Now, we've never lived in an apartment before. And I hear the people above me walking at night. And sometimes they're hammering on stuff. I don't know what they're building. And I'm thinking, come on, it's 1130, it's 1 in the morning. One night my wife said, you're going to have to go up there and knock on their door. It's 1 in the morning, you know. What are you building up here, you know? You're tearing down the transmission on your car or something. What are you doing, you know? But, uh, you know what? But we've met so many people. I want to tell you a story. If I, if I can get it out. Two or three weeks ago, I went in to play basketball in the gym. Now, I know I'm old and I do good. The best part of my game is fouling. I can foul real good now. But uh, don't bring in the paint. I will foul you. It's about, you know. But, uh, and I'll, I'll stay on one end because they're going to come back anyway. I don't have to run the whole court. But uh, anyway, um, I went in there and was playing basketball. and started meeting some, some guys in there playing basketball. I met this one guy named Jaquan. He goes, just call me Quan. Well, I played ball with him that night and met him. And then a few days later, three or four days later, we started playing. I went back in there again. He was in there again. This time, he was in there and I started talking with him. And I don't know what it is, but... We just kind of hit it off. I mean, I'm old, enough, I'm old enough to be his dad. We just kind of hit it off. And he starts talking to me. And he tells me this. He doesn't even know at this point. I haven't even witnessed to him. I haven't even told him that I'm a pastor or nothing. He says, man, I, I'm trying to get my life straightened out. <laughs> he said, I'm trying to get my life straightened out. And he told me of some situations of his life. He said, I'm trying to get my life straightened out. And he said, I had a kind of a rough life, but I'm trying to get my life straightened out. So we finished playing, we played a game, we finished, and uh, we, we went over, we started talking, and I said, hey, do you, you, where do you work? And I asked him where I work, and I said, do you know where I work? He said, no. I said, I just got a job, and I said, I've been here about three weeks. I said, I work over at North Florida Baptist Church. I'm an associate pastor over here, and he said, I thought you might be something like that. 
I guess because I didn't use bad language or something, you know, when I missed all my shots. But uh, he said, I thought you might be something like that. I knew, I knew, as sure as my name's Tommy Stone, that God put me with this guy. I knew it. I knew it. And so I ended up going over, and Brianna is his fiance, and she was there with him, and she was exercising and working. And I, so I met her, and I went over, and I got my phone out of my bag, and I called Donna, and I said, she was up in the apartment. I said, Donna, there's a couple. I really feel like God's letting us witness to them. Can, is it okay if I bring them up to the apartment? She said, yeah, bring them on up. So we went over, and I told him, I said, hey, y'all, don't you come up with you meet my wife? So we went up there, and, on, and uh, this was on a Sunday, Sunday evening. And we went up there and sat down, and I'm telling you, they were just ready to trust the Lord. They were just ready to trust the Lord. In fact, Brianna is here with my wife today. Ja Jaquan had to work. But they were just ready to serve and trust the Lord. And uh, it, was, it was just easy. We just read some verses in Romans, and they bowed their head and asked the Lord to save them. And Jaquan said this, <laughs> And this makes the hair on my arm stand up. He said, last night we prayed that God would bring some good people in our life. Now, I'm not saying I'm the good people. I'm just saying this, that God crossed their path with somebody. He crossed their path with somebody. See, they were searching, searching for God. And God brought them to a divine appointment. And they got saved. And yesterday I, we spent time with them and... Uh, ja Jaquan and I went out and ate lunch and we sat over there uh, and, and ate and, and we talked about basketball and some other stuff but we talked about some spiritual things and you know what? I see a, a young man and a young lady that now want to live for God and that only happened because God brought a divine appointment in their life and you know what? This week God's going to bring divine appointments in your life He will why don't you pray and say, God, bring some divine appointments in my life. Cross my path with somebody. Give me somebody that I can speak to, and he will. Because, see, we live in a whole world of people that need a divine appointment. G John 7, 37 says, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. And you and I as Christians, we know the living water. We have the living water, the truth to give. But how many times... Do we go to work and we miss it? We go to the ball game and we miss it. We go through life and we miss it. We sit down in the restaurant and that girl comes over and waits on us and we could give her a track, but we miss it. We could give her an invitation to church, but we miss it. And they're all around us. They're all around us. So this is my challenge today. Just as Jesus had to go through Samaria, where do you have to go this week? Who are you supposed to meet this week? There's somebody out there for you. There's somebody that is searching for God that we as individuals and we as a church body need to witness to this week. You see, this morning, when we read this, we realized the disciples, they were too busy buying bread. They went to the town to buy bread, and when they come back, they said, why are you talking to her? Because they didn't see the need. They didn't see the divine appointment. Hey, I think if the disciples could do that, I think I sure could do that too. They didn't see it. What, what did we say the key was at the beginning? Walking in the Spirit of God. That when the Holy Spirit says, give that person a gospel track. Invite that person to church. Have that person over your house to eat supper with you. You see, sacrifices to be made. Speak something into that person. Tell that person, they need Christ. Let that person know you love them as their friend. What is it this week that God wants us to do? You know what? If I'm not careful, I live my life or just me and my little family and, and I just live my life that way and I go through life and I die and I go to heaven and who did I take with me? Many Christians take zero with them. Zero. But it's not supposed to be that way. You see, there was a song years ago that said this, let me see this world, dear Lord, as though I were looking through your eyes, the eyes of God. And when I look like Jesus looks at people, I see them in a whole different realm. I don't see a nationality or a skin color. I don't see that they're rich or they're poor or whatever. I don't see any of that. I see a person that is a soul that's going to spend eternity in heaven or hell. Their sin's going to be paid for 
or they're going to pay for it. And I see a person that needs Jesus Christ. You have been watching the Family Bible Hour, a ministry of North Florida Baptist Church in Tallahassee, Florida. If you would like a copy of today's message on CD or DVD, write to us at Family Bible Hour, 3000 North Meridian Road, Tallahassee, Florida, 32312. Visit us online at nflchurch.com or call us at 850-385-7181. Join us again next time for the Family Bible Hour.